I've been waiting for this question. Let's talk about why herniated discs are actually an early propulsive problem. Good morning. Happy Tuesday. I have Neuro Coffee in hand and, mm, oh, it is perfect. Okay. Busy Tuesday, clinic day. Got to get rolling. Let's dig into today's Q&A. Um, this one comes from Zach, and Zach, this is going to be a great question because I've been waiting for this one because I think I got a pretty good explanation, at least something that's useful. And so uh, Zach says, I was wondering if you could explain through your model why someone might present with a directional preference in the case of low back pain with radiculopathy. Example, peripheralization with flexion and centralization with extension or vice versa, or someone who doesn't centralize with either. We were always just taught that this could occur but was never provided with a rationale as to why people present differently. Also, how would your treatment strategies change based off of someone's directional preference? Or does your model already account for this in some way and the need to consider the directional preference becomes less important? Thanks as always, Zach. Great question. Okay, so we're kind of talking about um, stuff that's related, that we'll see related to disc herniations, radiculopathies, referred pain, and things like that. So. So let's talk about that first and foremost. So how does this whole disc thing come into, come into play? How do we evolve a herniation? So um, what we wanna to start to think about is, okay, so we have a change in the disc and how does that happen? And so what we have to do is we have to have some way to change the disc. And if we look at discs, they don't have great blood supply, so they are very reliant on the bone, um, the subchondral bone, very specifically as to where they're going to get their groceries, their water, and, and their oxygen. And so we're gonna get diffusion from the subchondral bone of all these nutrients into the disc. That's how the disc is gonna remain healthy. But let's say that we squish down on this, this blood supply in some way, shape, or form. So let's just say, oh, I don't know, we have an anterior orientation that puts a posterior compressive strategy on the vertebral body, and we now have a reduction in blood flow to that posterior aspect of the disc. So the disc is your basic radial tire kind of a representation. So we've got multiple layers. We've got helical orientation of fibers going in all different directions. This sucker is actually very durable and very, very strong under most circumstances until you take away its nutrition and then it starts to break down. And so over time then, what we have is a situation where you have a, a weakening of this, this posterior aspect of the disc. And so what I'm going to offer you, Zach, is that this whole situation starts with the disc becoming a yielding strategy that we would normally use in early propulsion. So um, let me give you an example of how this looks in the thorax. So if I take a cross section of a thorax and I'm gonna create a turn or I'm gonna create a delay. So, so what you're looking at is you look at the small arrows and the posterior aspect of this thorax and that would represent a concentric yielding strategy that it would use in the posterior aspect of the thorax is if I was taking a step forward or making a turn. So the yield creates a delay to allow the other side of the body to, to get ahead as if I was taking a step forward. Now, if we look at what a, a disc protrusion looks like, you will see this scary kind of similarity as to how this process is going to be initiated. And so all I have to do is have reduction in the resiliency of this posterior disc. And now I can create a greater degree of expansion on one side or the other. And so again, the disc becomes this fractal representation of a larger representation in, in the thorax or in, in the pelvis. And so because early propulsion requires that I have a yielding strategy on that side, what if I can't yield? And so under the circumstances of say an anterior orientation of the pelvis, I'm actually gonna get a reduction in the yielding strategy. So what this would look like, Zach, is if I anteriorly orient the pelvis, I can't create this yield. So the yield is where I'm gonna see this counter mutation and an ER in this posterior aspect of the pelvis. So this is my delay strategy as this foot lands on the ground. So if I was looking at a foot, let me grab my foot here. What I have to have in this early propulsive strategy is a foot that looks like that. And so again, this is a delay strategy. So this is my early propulsive strategy which creates the delay that allows 
the other side of the body to get ahead. And so again, if I have an anterior orientation, that produces this posterior compressive strategy in the vertebral body, it's gonna reduce the blood flow to the disc or the, the diffusion to the disc, and then I get my breakdown. So now I start with my bulge, my protrusion, my herniation, my extrusion, or my sequestration, depending on the degree that this, this process is allowed to evolve. And so if the disc becomes my yielding strategy, now I can sensitize the nociceptors in that disc, right? So right away, so there's my, at minimum, I could be getting some measure of low back pain associated with that. The stronger the yielding strategy that I would be using, the greater the stimulus to the nociceptors. And so we kind of know this, that, that if we're dif differentiating between say, um, referred pain or, or radicular pain, so there is a difference, there's actually a significant difference. Um, the radicular pain tends to be very, very, very sharp um, stabbing, um, knife-like pain is typically the way people are going to, to describe this. And when we talk about radicular pain from the research, what they're gonna say is, well, anything past the knee would be considered radicular pain, but I would caution you uh, against that belief system. Um, there's a study from way back before you were born um, in the late 80s by uh, Haldeman that showed that when they stimulated the disc, depending on the degree of stimulation, they could actually produce pain that, that went down, well down into the leg past the knee. And this was not ridiculous, this is actually referred. The referred pain tends to be more of like this dull, non-specific kind of a kind of a pain versus like the sharp stabby kind uh, of the ridiculous. But the, the point I'm trying to make here is that is that is that the degree of stimulus, so the degree of yielding strategy that I'm that I'm relying on this disc to produce is going to increase the intensity and therefore the the uh, proliferation or or the degree of the referred pain. So the farther down the leg that I'm going to experience this, that means I'm just getting a greater stimulus to the disc. So now you get an idea of why some people centralize and some people might not. Because let's just say that I have a greater expansive strategy or I'm, I'm demanding more yielding strategy on this, this disc. And so there's the greater stimulation. So that's going to create more, more pain down the leg, might be harder for me to centralize. However, when I do put somebody on their belly and I take tension off of this, this demand for yielding on this side, that might be why I see this so-called centralization phenomenon, which might not be centralization per se, it's just reducing the amount of stimulus to these nociceptors. And so again, that's one of those things that we, we have to, to take into consideration is, is this, this quality of pain, the degree of the stimulation, and that's going to help determine who's going to respond um, more than, than, than another human being. So if we want to start talking about solutions, Zach, what we want to start to think about is that we always have a directional preference. So one of your comments is, does the model already account for this in some way? Absolutely it does, because it doesn't have to revolve around pain as far as our directional preference. We always have one based on our structure, our orientation, and any compensatory strategies that we may apply. So that's exactly what you're looking at. What you're looking at though, is the response of, of in, in this situation, when we're talking about a disc injury, we're, we're talking about where the yielding strategy is applying. So, so number one is don't do stuff that hurts, okay? That's kind of like the, the obvious. And then second, treat the human. So we want to use our measures that we would typically use to identify what their true preferences are based on their structure and their orientation. And like I said, any uh, compensatory strategies. Most likely what you're gonna to have to do, depending on which side that you're dealing with, is you're gonna to have to restore the normal early propulsive strategies. Now, let me give you a simple rule of thumb. If you're dealing with a left-sided issue, you're probably gonna have a pelvis that is oriented forward and it's gonna be driven more on the left than it is on the right. And so we're gonna see this later propulsive strategy on the left driving forward. If we have symptoms on the right, typically what we're gonna have, we're gonna have an anterior orientation of the pelvis, but it's gonna be tipped on the oblique axis. So, so right away, now we have some resources to deal with. Number one, I would go look at the video they did about a week ago where I was talking about hip flexion and propulsion. So you understand the early and late propulsive strategies from the ground up. So we talked about the foot and we talked about the pelvis us there. Secondly, what I would do is I would go through all the videos that are talking about restoring hip ranges of motion and especially the ones that discuss the propulsive phases. And so this is heels elevated stuff for the early propulsive strategies and, and the like of that. So Zach, this is a great question. Um, 
the, to, to wrap it up into a nutshell, a herniated disc is most likely based on my model and my understanding, and I'm willing to be wrong here, so keep that in mind, I'm willing to be wrong. It's most likely an early propulsive problem. So you're using the disc as the yielding strategy in early propulsion rather than distributing it through the system from the foot, through the extremity, through the pelvis, through the thorax, through the cervical spine, and even through the, the, the cranium. So having a distributed yield, now we have a focal yield and the disc is unfortunately taking the load for us here. So um, I hope that answers your question. If it doesn't, go to askbillharmon at gmail.com, askbillharmon at gmail.com, and I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank <laughs> you.